There's no shortage of creepy and terrifying mysteries in the world. While technology has come a long way in terms of solving cold cases and explaining seemingly paranormal phenomena, it has also expanded our ability to communicate with one another and share creepy, off-putting and macabre stories from around the globe. Here, today, some of the creepiest mysteries that you probably haven't heard of. Back in 2014, a student in Fiji got in a cab and found a cell phone on the seat next to him. Being the good Samaritan that he was, the student looked on the phone to see if he could find anything that might identify the owner so he could return it to them. Or maybe he was just hoping that the phone belonged to a girl who enjoyed taking erotic selfies since he went looking through the image and video gallery immediately. Either way, nothing prepared him for what he was about to see. The video on the phone showed four men clinging to wreckage in the ocean, trying to hold their hands up in surrender. Their pleas for mercy were in vain, and the 10-minute video recorded their lives ending in an unnecessarily plentiful barrage of gunfire. Shocked by the gruesome content, the student immediately realized the correct course of action was to turn the phone over to the Fijian authorities. But first of all, he had to violate YouTube's strict no-snuff-films policy. Neither the victims nor the assailants were ever identified, and how could they be? Yes, there was a video of the four men who were shot to death at sea and after the deaths of the executioners, whose voices were heard throughout the video yelling things like shoot, shoot, shoot and be prepared, turned the camera around to reveal their faces and posed for several minutes. With the camera turned around, the registration number on the hull of the ship was visible and it was identified as a Taiwanese tuna fishing ship named Chun I-217. There really wasn't much evidence to go on. The prevailing theory is that the victims were a group of Somali pirates who tried to hijack the wrong fishing vessel. The attacks in the video were speaking Mandarin, and the voices have been identified as being Taiwanese, Thai, and Vietnamese. What this ultimately means is that while the cell phone containing the video was found in Fiji, neither the alleged pirates or the fishermen were Fijian, so with no official complaints or reports of missing people, the Fijian authorities aren't terribly interested in investigating this matter further. The people in this video may never be identified, but there are two important lessons to learn from it. First, there was a banner on the fishing vessel that read, Safety is number one in Mandarin. So if you ever engage in piracy and see such a sign, assume that the crew is heavily armed for their own safety. The other lesson is to always lock your cell phone. On March 26, 1991, five young boys from Daegu, South Korea, wanted to have a bit of fun. It was a national holiday on account of the first democratic elections in 30 years. So, with school council, they went out to search for salamander eggs in the streams of Mount Woyong. One of the boys briefly returned home to grab a thicker jacket, then ran off telling his mother that he was going back outside. This was the last time any of the boys, ages 9 through 13, would ever be seen alive. When the boys didn't return home, their parents got worried and contacted the police. The police weren't at all interested, saying they were probably just out playing late. Everything in the country had been consumed by the elections, and missing children were not being seen as a priority. Strange thing not to be a priority there. It took almost a week for the police to take any action, at which point they referred to the children as runaways, much to the ire of the parents. While it had taken far too long for anyone to take the missing children seriously, it quickly became a national story. An early TV report said that they were hunting for frogs, and thus they became known as the Frog Boys. With the South Korean media now focused on the story, President Roh Tae-woo sent 300,000 police and military troops to search for the missing children, and the search was broadcast on live TV. Luckily for the viewers, but unfortunately for the parents, no one was found. Because they were searching for salamander eggs, it was believed that they have to have been by the streams of Mount Woyong. The mountain was searched over 500 times. The fathers of the children quit their jobs to dedicate themselves full-time to searching for the children, but to no avail. After three years of searching, they finally returned to work because of financial troubles. There was a lot of speculation of foul play in. There were plenty of conspiracies. The area they were hunting for eggs was near a military base with the shooting range just a few hundred meters up the mountain from a pond well within the effective range of an M16 rifle. There had been unofficial reports of a gunshot followed by a scream the day the frog boys went missing, but this was largely dismissed because, well, reasons. Eleven years after the disappearance, two hikers were collecting acorns on a trail on Mount Woyong when they spotted old clothes among the rocks, followed by the boys' remains. The sleeves of one of the boys' shirts was tied together, and when the knot was undone, a collection of both unused bullets and empty casings fell out. 
The police came and dug up the bone, something they were in no way qualified to do. By the time a forensics expert arrived, he found an absurd situation. The police had spent upwards of three hours destroying the scene due to not being trained to handle something like this and not realizing they should wait for someone who knew what they were doing. The next day, the police chief declared hypothermia to be the most likely cause of death. It hadn't been cold. The boys were in an area that they knew extremely well, and even if it had suddenly become cold, rainy, and windy, it was only about a five-minute run back to their houses. No one believed the story, and further investigation showed trauma to three of the skulls, possibly from a blunt metal object. The only piece of this case that has been solved is that it's now known to be 100% murder, not simply boys who ran away and succumbed to the elements. Who the culprit is and the motivation remains a mystery. By the time the bodies were found, there was nothing left but bones, and they had to be identified by their clothes and dental braces. The parents took the ashes of all five boys to the Nakdong River, releasing them to float out into the Pacific Ocean. One of the fathers remarked, They died together, so we wanted them to play together in the afterlife. Henry McCobb was a Liberian man who immigrated to the United States, living in Moundsview, Minnesota. On September 5, 2015, his wife was in California, so Henry and his friends went to the club. They left the club early in the morning on September 7. Henry's friend, William Kennedy, dropped him off at a local gas station convenience store at around 2 o'clock in the morning. The only problem was that he had no wallet and no keys. William claimed that he had taken Henry's wallet at the club to stop him from buying more drinks. Why he had Henry's keys is less clear, but with Henry's wife out of town, he would not be able to get into his house, and he was unable to buy whatever snack food at the gas station he was craving when he requested being dropped off there. It turns out that this was the least of his problems. At 2.28 a.m., his phone pocket dialed his wife. When she picked up the phone, she heard him exclaim that he had been shot, followed by a combination of unsettling growling noises combined with more high-pitched squealing that was like Henry crying. Henry's wife tried to add his brother to the call, but he was asleep and didn't answer. His voicemail recorded the last two minutes of the phone call. The call is so disturbing that media outlets have not released a full, unedited copy of the audio, but the sounds of growling can be clearly heard. It sounds like something between a bear, a wolverine, or perhaps Chewbacca. The voicemail ends with Henry yelling, stop it. While William originally fell under suspicion as the CCTV for the gas station did not show him dropping his friend off and because he had Henry's personal items in his possession, police later found CCTV footage of William at a different nearby gas station. He simply got the name wrong. With no tangible leads, all authorities could do was continue the search and hope that when they found Henry's body, it would give them some clue as to what happened. It took almost two months, but Henry's body was found in Rush Lake on November the 2nd. Finally, it could be examined and they could find out who or what attacked Henry. The result was shocking. The death was deemed unsuspicious. There were no signs of a struggle, no bite marks from an animal, no wounds of any kind. Despite having explicitly said that he was shot, his completely uninjured body seemed to tell a different story. Henry appeared to have just been another tragic tale of someone who got too drunk and fell in a river or a lake, ultimately drowning. By all accounts, there were absolutely no signs of foul play in this case, which makes the voicemail of the attack even more chilling. What exactly did the phone record that night? Antoinette Caedita was born in Gallup, New Mexico on Christmas 1976. Her mother was Navajo and her father was Hispanic. Her parents separated at a young age, leaving Antoinette and her two sisters with her mother. Around three in the morning on April 6, 1986, there was a knock on the door. The mother had been out at a bar the night before and was likely too fast asleep to hear the knock. Antoinette and her younger sister Wendy were both awake, so they approached the door and asked who it was. The voice on the other side of the door said, Uncle Joe. And as the girls really did have an Uncle Joe, Antoinette opened the door. She was immediately grabbed by two men who took her kicking and screaming to a brown van. Wendy said she didn't recognize the men, but also didn't get a good look at their faces. The next morning, her mother went to prepare the girls for Bible school, something Antoinette reportedly loved, but she was not in her room. Her mother checked with all the neighbors to see if anyone had seen her, then called the police. If you're wondering why Wendy didn't immediately go to their mother when Antoinette was taken, remember that she was only five years old and was likely very scared and confused after witnessing such a traumatic event. Police, along with the help of neighbors and the family, searched the area, but no trace of the nine-year-old girl was found. As the weeks and months passed, it seemed as if all hope was lost. 
A year after the disappearance, the Gallup Police Department received a phone call from a frantic young girl who identified herself repeatedly as Antoinette Cayadito. She said that she was in Albuquerque, New Mexico, but before she could give more details, an angry adult voice was heard shouting, Who said you could use the phone? There was the sound of the girl screaming, then a physical altercation, and then nothing as the call disconnected. Her mother listened to the tape again and again. There was absolutely no doubt in her mind that this really was the voice of her daughter, but there were no more clues that could be found, and the trail went cold. The kidnapped girl had still been alive, but for how long? Especially now that she had so severely violated the rules of whoever was holding her captive, it seemed like she may never be seen again. Four more years passed when a waitress at a diner in Carson City, Nevada, called the Carson City Police Department about a strange incident that happened that day. She was waiting on a party of three, an adult male and female, both very unkempt, and a young girl around the age of 14 or 15. The girl kept deliberately knocking her utensils off the table, seemingly to get the waitress's attention, and every time she came to pick them up, the girl would grab the waitress's hand and squeeze it firmly. Apparently, this sort of thing must happen all the time because the waitress didn't think anything of it and continued on with her job. After the family left the restaurant, she went to bust the table and upon lifting up the young girl's plate, saw a napkin with four words written on it. Help me, call police. She called the police and she described the young girl as a potential match for Antoinette. This was the last time anyone allegedly saw Antoinette alive over 30 years ago. She would be turning 46 years old this Christmas, and while law enforcement believes that she is deceased, she is still officially listed as a missing person, and her case remains open. There are a lot of theories surrounding what happened to Antoinette. The girl was obviously kidnapped and seemingly kept alive for years after, but with nothing in the way of leads or evidence, everything else is just baseless speculation. There are many theories, some of which revolve around Antoinette's mother, but they lack any specific evidence. With the aforementioned Uncle Joe having a firm alibi that was corroborated by witnesses, the mother being allegedly asleep inside at the time of the abduction and no other leads to point the accusatory finger, much of it has fallen to Antoinette's mother, not because of evidence, but because of lack of options. And because she passed away in 1999, there's no one to defend her or set the record straight. The fate of the poor young girl that was kidnapped from her home may be forever unknown, but if she really was the teenager that kept clinging to the waitress's hand in Nevada, one can only imagine the sort of hell that she was living through for those five years. And who knows how much longer. <laughs> So I hope you enjoyed today's video. Before you leave, let me tell you about a new channel that I'm doing called Into the Shadows. So maybe the world isn't dark enough for you. Well, good news, it absolutely is. And if you'd like to know more about the horrible things that humans have been doing to each other since, well, time immemorial, well, please check out that new channel, Into the Shadows. From landmines to penal colonies to horrific diseases, if it's horrific, we cover it. Check it out through the link in the description below. Again, it's called Into the Shadows. And thank you for watching.